And I want to welcome you this morning to our gallery talk with Abby Hepner. I just want to read her bio real quick, and then we'll get started. So Abby Hepner holds an MFA in photography from the University of New Mexico and undergraduate degrees in art and psychology from the University of Utah. She previously taught at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. She serves on the board of directors for the Society of Photographic Education and teaches at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, as an assistant professor of art and head of area head of photography. So we welcome you all here and welcome Abby. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna like turn my computer on because it's really weird to talk with people behind the <laughs> front of me. But I am gonna sit for most of it. Um, I'm usually like one of those people that is really antsy and up and moving around, but I just had a baby, <laughs> so I'm obeying doctor's orders and like taking it really easy. So let's see if we can swap this. I'm going to put this on the projector through that book are linked in time and they're linked through history and the events that happen that happen over and over and over again. Um, and I think part of this is for me that uh, our ancestors' stories are our epigenetic stories and nuclear issues are global issues. And so I talk about this work, I think about it being in our blood and in our bones and in our atmosphere. Um, and each project in the book is uh, woven together through nuclear energy, the atomic bomb, and radioactive waste. And by capturing these kind of distinct marks in time, I'm making visible the ongoing and often invisible uh, relationship that we have to nuclear technologies. So, uh, in 2012, I did a, a residency in Berlin, Germany, and I traveled to dozens of nuclear plants across the country, and I made this video work. Um, after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, Germany immediately closed eight nuclear plants and started the decommissioning of all other nuclear plants. And so using my body in a performance-like gesture, I was creating a mark in time in the landscape surrounding the building as it was in flux between active and abandoned. And at the time I made this work, I was really interested in uh, the kind of architectural remnants of this place that was impotent. Oh, thank you. 
also still really dangerous. Um, and part of what made me want to go to Germany was I thought, that's so strange to close all these nuclear plants. What I have been told and what I understood was that they were opening all of these coal plants and I thought, oh, we're going backwards in time, right? Um, what I discovered that that wasn't true at all and that it was actually really hard for me to um, really gain any clear information about what was happening with energy policies at the time. So that um, whole trip, traveling across Germany, was just eye-opening, like realizing what I understood um, and what I was told, what I read in media in the United States. <laughs> was like, there's no clarity about anything. I just went and I'm like, I have no idea anymore. Um, and so not long after making that work, my partner and I moved to Japan. And he was working um, on nuclear aircraft carriers and submarines for the Navy. Um, and so that was really interesting, right? To have my partner kind of working in the field and myself like really questioning uh, what was going on in the world with nuclear issues at the time. And so while I lived there, I spent some time volunteering in the disaster zone up north that was left from the tsunami. Um, and that really gave me a new perspective to be living with people who were deeply, deeply impacted by um, both the tsunami and the nuclear disaster. Uh, often living in kind of temporary housing for years and years and years while still essentially paying a mortgage on the house in uh, Fukushima that they could never return to. Um, and I was really, I became really intrigued by these mascot characters. <laughs> they were very strange. Um, they promoted everything from bridges to local prefectures. And up until the Fukushima disaster, they actually had an amusement park called Adam World. Um, <laughs> And you have mascots like this famous one, Plutonium Coon, who shows you, look, you can drink plutonium, it goes right through your body. Um, it won't do anything to you, which I thought was very strange. <laughs> um, and each of the nuclear power plants in Japan has its own mascot character that promotes the plant. So it's super strange. Um, so I made this project <laughs> with these kind of nuclear mascots. Um, and I made this in part because actually Japan's nuclear energy propaganda came directly from the United States. So I had a sort of uneasy feeling about living uh, abroad and sort of just like criticizing the nuclear industry. But what I realized was that actually it was deeply a part of my like own culture. Um, and so part of Eisenhower's 1953 Adams for Peace program um, paid for the infrastructure and um, the engineering to bring nuclear technologies to Japan and India. So that comes right from the US. In fact, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, um, what is a GE plant, right? So we have the same kind of models here. So I modified this costume, I created this fictional character that I imagined was like a descendant from pro and anti-nuclear propaganda. And he's shown in scenes with reference to nuclear history. Um, and it, it kind of pokes fun at like Astro Boy and all of these other like early nuclear propaganda. And then the final image, I purchased a digital billboard and screened an image for 15 seconds every hour. And this image was shown in Shibuya Crossing, the busiest pedestrian crossing in the world with over one million people crossing a day. And so this um, public art intervention took six minutes of commercial advertising and replaced it with the image of this character who points out at onlookers and then back at himself, raising a question about the role of media and propaganda in man-made disasters. And part of the reason I did this was because at the time, Every uh, newspaper in Japan was owned or received advertising money from Tokyo Electric Power Company. And so, you know, I had always been really interested in how people understand the ongoing disaster, how they make decisions about it, uh, and what do you do when your news source, right, relies on money from 
the very source that um, co contributed to the disaster. And so in this, I'm giving nod to artists uh, Giacometti, Akanchi, and Takeuchi, who um, are different artists with these gestures. Um, Takeuchi is the, they call him the finger pointing man, who was there at the um, Fukushima Daiichi plant and found this um, video. Basically, it's this recording that's 24 hours a day live streaming, and he just stands there for an hour pointing, raising a question. So in 2013, I moved to Albuquerque for graduate school, and I found myself once again in a place with like a deep history, uh, nuclear history. And the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIC, which is in, down south, um, is the nation's only underground repository for radioactive waste. And that's where they bury radioactive waste beneath salt. So I created this body of work that you see in this space called Transuranic. And it's 13 9 inch by 13 inch uranotypes or uranium prints from every site in the western US that ships radioactive waste to WIP. So I spent a summer driving across the transuranic waste route, uh, the route that these giant trucks carry radioactive waste across the country on, and I photographed each site. Uh, nuclear plants, research labs, and site that, sites that built and tested the nuclear bomb. And I traveled to these places to bear witness and to understand them as non-places. These kind of huge swaths of land that we aren't supposed to notice, yet actually exist in many of our backyards. Um, and every nuclear site in the western U.S. had something in common. They were really quiet. They were pretty boring. <laughs> They're very banal. Um, and what I experienced in those places, I felt like couldn't be translated into a still photograph without indicating the body and without um, indicating the material presence, uh, a way to kind of make the invisible visible. So I talk a lot um, about uh, photographers and this kind of link to history that uh, nuclear and radiation has. And uh, photographers have always been pioneers of technology, um, but also about, they're also a big part of the um, people who discovered things about the body and the way that the world works. And early photographers were scientists and sometimes um, discovering accidentally phenomena like x-rays and radioactivity. And so there's this link that I've always found really, really exciting in the history of photography. And uranium, I discovered, a radioactive element used in nuclear power and atomic bombs can also make photographs. So sometimes people think that I like invented this, that I made it up. I didn't. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, like someone once upon a time made uranotypes, and I don't know, like I can, I I know why it didn't stick. Let's say that, right? <laughs> They're very, um, they're not very high contrast. They're this like muddy, kind of muted tone. Um, they're not particularly beautiful. Some people like disagree. They're, they're haunting in their material. Um, but they're also really difficult to make. They're 40, 40 minute exposures, which is really quite long. So um, I began my research into this process and I found a couple of these early images. Um, which was difficult to find. Um, they're from the late 1800s. There's not many uranotypes in archives. But I found these images and I shared it with one of the um, Japanese volunteers that I worked with when I was in Japan. And she shared it with her grandmother who told me that the color of the uranotype looked like the color of the sky after the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima. And that was haunting to me. Um, and I knew at that point what I needed to do. So I went to New York where I worked with a photographer and a chemical handler who gave me a tutorial on making uranotypes. And over 90% of uranium um, used in the nuclear industry in the US comes from foreign sources. It comes to the East Coast and it's dispersed throughout the country. And so just as I had done in the transuranic waste route tracing these sites, 
um, I had traced this kind of import and dispersal. And so here's the original digital photograph. And then using Photoshop, I convert it into a black and white image. And I'm using a precise curve that I figured out works for uranotypes. And then I painted urinal nitrate solution onto paper and placed the digital negative on it. And as I mentioned, it's a 40 minute exposure in a UV box. And so with uranium, the danger is internal. Uh, so you work with this process in liquid form, so you don't have any risk of inhalation, which is really important. Um, and then the chemical handler that I have basically is hired just to watch me because it's this long process of um, exposure, you have gloves, you're protecting um, anything that you're wearing, it goes into the bath, you take your gloves off, you put new gloves on, like, it's just this whole process, you want somebody to watch you the whole time so that you're never getting it on your skin. And so even though I'm using um, a form that's similar to what they've seen slides with in uh, medical laboratories, you have to be really careful, obviously. And so the prints are, of course, mildly radioactive. That's why we have this like clicking warning sound constantly from our Geiger counters. Um, they're about 200 to 300 counts per minute above background and only on the surface of the print. So um, like the, these works are behind glass, and so they won't meter from the Geiger counter. You actually have to have the Geiger counter sitting on the prints. Which I know, like, for most museums and galleries, they're like, you want us to do what? <laughs> like, placing things directly on the print, but that's the only way it will read. And so they're about 40% less uh, radioactive than salts made from natural uranium. And what does that all mean? <laughs> um, they're more radioactive than a banana and a Brazil nut. Uh, but less than a lot of clay and shale and brick that you would find in places like where I lived in Colorado, which is at super high elevation. Um, and I always tell people, too, the biggest danger is, like, you really don't want to eat them. That would be really <laughs> terrible. So it's a little bit difficult to represent on screen, but we're lucky that in this space we can see them in person. Um, I should have brought a UV light, but like one of the things that's really amazing, if you turn up all the lights and shown a UV light on them, they actually fluoresce. Mm -hmm. So they glow back. So I discovered when I tried to scan them, scan them that it's like, that <laughs> not actually going to happen very well. Um, so there is something sort of strange and haunting about the material. And many, many photographers have made work about toxic landscapes. Um, there's so many, so many photographers that I've been inspired by, like Patrick Nantani, which was uh, one of my early mentors in Albuquerque, um, and certainly David Mizell, who made the black maps work. Um, but for me, I ask myself, what, what is that risk if I create beauty from toxicity? If it's in the framework that we exist at a distance from it, which is Sometimes the way I feel when I'm looking at work that feels really removed from myself. And so I felt like we had, for my work, it needed to be quiet. Uh, it needed to be sometimes as banal as these spaces. Um, but it also needed to be threatening. And as I stood above the cliffs of Los Alamos National Labs in New Mexico, where the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was made, I thought about uh, what my fellow volunteers' grandmothers said. Um, and it was at that point that I started this project. I took a photograph of this place of secrecy that had brought about so much destruction, and I gave it the color of the bomb. So the aim of transuranic is really to provoke my audience. Um, often when I show this, you'll like enter through a curtain, and it's really dimly lit. I love the, the way that the space is functioning and you kind of turn through it to see the work. Um, and I mentioned the Geiger counters too. You, we have um, a Cold War era Geiger counter and then also a modern digital Geiger counter. And for me, that's an echo to this like history repeating itself.
So I'll skip over that because we can hear the sound in here. Um, this print is a photograph taken at Nevada National Test Site. Between 1951 and 1992, the U.S. government conducted a total of 1,021 nuclear tests here. And part of the reason that I'm really fascinated by social and cultural history is I felt very deprived of family history. Um, my mother's family lived in southern Utah and southern Idaho and owned a dairy farm. And they were downwinders who suffered in the aftermaths of the radiation that blew north, covering the land that they owned in a white powder, eventually killing the cows and some of them. So two of my great uncles died at the age of 20 four and 42 of myeloid leukemia. Uh, it's a rare cancer that has no ties to atomic testing. And while I'll never hear their stories, and it's not what initially compelled me to make the work, um, I think it's a kind of epigenetic story that's in my blood. And I often don't talk that much about it because I don't know all that much about it, but my ancestors were Mormon pioneers. They were ordered by Brigham Young to um, go to southern Utah and to settle in that area. And what's interesting is um, the Mormons have a deep kind of tie to nuclear history as well. Um, very much moving to those areas and kind of turning a blind eye to what was happening with nuclear testing. And so that's a part of my history as well, right? Like, Certainly they were deeply affected, but they drove out indigenous communities, and those indigenous communities have been more impacted by uranium um, mining and nuclear technologies than really anyone else in this country. Um, and that's something that, you know, like you dig into your own family history and you realize this is like really quite dark. Uh, history, and I thought the places that I've lived, that I have deeply, deeply loved, how much they have impacted indigenous communities. So in the book, there's a foldout that lists the name and date of all of the nuclear bombs tested in U.S. soil. Um, and of course, many others were tested outside of the U.S., but I think the history of downwinders in the U.S. is a story that's like rarely told. And so as a result of this rapid rise in nuclear technologies in the 1950s and 60s, the amount of carbon-14 in our atmosphere doubled. And this is a like, kind of interesting phenomenon that I've always been fascinated with um, called radiocarbon dating. So we can date every living thing on Earth back to the atomic bomb which is amazing. Um, tooth enamel, for example, whether it's in humans or at animals, doesn't regenerate once it's formed. So the carbon-14 in your teeth um, represents the carbon-14 uh, in the atmosphere at the time of formation, and that never regenerates. So anyone born prior to 1955 when carbon-14 doubled, has very low levels of carbon-14 in their teeth, but for anyone born after, they're marked with what's called a bomb pulse. Mm -hmm. And we can date your bodies not only back to the bomb, but also um, we have a sort of general sense of the region in which you're from, and it's close proximity to nuclear testing, the areas that we're doing nuclear testing. That's just like wild to me, right? Like it just destroys the myth of like isolation and it connects us all back together and all back to this moment in time that is like the beginning of the Anthropocene. So um, in 2015, I traveled to Waynesboro, Georgia and I did a project titled Control Room. And this was about Plant Vogel, which is the first uh, nuclear energy reactors to be built in the US in over 30 years. Um, they're scheduled to go online uh, actually next month. I feel like they keep coming up to be scheduled and then it gets delayed and delayed, but they've been building this since 2015. Um, and the U.S. is said to be in this kind of nuclear renaissance, and there hasn't been any new plants built since the uh, Three Mile Island incident that happened in the 1970s. And so I was really fascinated by that. Um, and this series is all digital photographs, and one of the only projects that I've done in a more kind of documentary style, I went to this uh, place, to Waynesboro, 
to meet with residents to understand the way they felt about this plant, um, to meet with plant workers. And um, I spent a lot of time at Plant Pogo and also with members in the community, those who opposed the plant, those who supported it. And my goal was really to learn from the community and to understand the benefits and concerns that came along with this new construction. And so, um, as I mentioned, my partner worked um, on nuclear aircraft carriers and submarines for a long time. So I have a lot of friends who are nuclear engineers, which is interesting because I'm not neutral in this, in my sort of approach. I'm definitely very critical. Um, but the work that I have done was very much from the beginning with so many questions. Um, and to me, the questions are a lot more exciting than any of the answers. That's what I like about um, doing art and particularly photography. But, and I feel like this is one of the more difficult photographic projects that I've made, right? Um, because I, have, I was really conflicted about my own sort of opinions. Uh, but I, I think it's our job as artists too to complicate things, not to simplify them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, that sort of like complicated response and reaction in myself is what kind of fuels the work. So the final photograph that I'm going to show you from this series was this sort of strange serendipitous moment that happens that I think happens when we're making work and we're like on the right track. Um, and I captured a photograph that was unbeknownst to the engineers in this space. I, I'm uh, here photographing through one-way mirror, so I can see them, but they, they can't see me. Um, and this was on uh, the anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster, and they happened to be doing their sort of annual safety test. I don't know if it was linked to that being the anniversary. But I captured this moment after a safety test failed. Now here, this is in um, the control room simulator. So had this actually been um, in the real control room, right, there would have been a nuclear disaster. But to me, this is a really pivotal photograph because on one hand, you can read it as a critique. And on the other, you can see this sort of reaction and frustration and in the part of the engineers here who, I mean, it's their job to like protect people, right? So I had the pleasure of working with um, two geographers from my book. Scott White created maps for the book and Dr. Mark Finko helped me um, get aerial images for the project from the Nat uh, National Agricultural Imagery Program. And that's the work that you see in here, these aerial photographs. And so Monument Plinth features aerial images from 40 uranium disposal cells across the US. And uranium disposal cells, if you're not familiar, are geometric mounds engineered to isolate radioactive material from the surrounding environment. And the mounds sit above the ground and cover surfaces anywhere from just a few acres to half a mile. And so there's an outer shell, kind of riprap, and then clay soil layer that covers the radioactive material. And they're um, designed to allow for rain to fall on them and to run off without kind of putting um, radioactive material into the surrounding environment. And so typically, um, in places like the southwest where I'm from, um, the cells are made from mining, like old mining materials, demolished buildings at uranium mines. And the cells in the Midwest and East, like we have nearby here, are most commonly from uranium metal engineering and processing sites. So I printed and mounted each aerial image on a black acrylic and laser engraved the cell detail into the surface, kind of reflecting this internal space or void. And I'm using Illustrator to render the files and um, the shape and depth of these disposal cells. And then the laser etching actually matches a corresponding depth. Um, and it decides kind of how intense to burn into the material. So here's an example of the laser on the photographic surface. 
So it's essentially like burning the photograph and burning into the acrylic, um, creating a three-dimensional deck. And um, that corresponds to a mathematical calculation of how high they sit above the ground. And I'm just doing the inverse, which makes a kind of void. So some of the sites that produce it, um, the waste contained in the cells date back, of course, to the Manhattan Project. And they are created to mine and construct nuclear weapons. Um, and some today are from the nuclear energy industry. So the amount of radioactivity in the cells vary, but most radiation comes from uranium-238, and the half-life is as old as the Earth, so 4.47 billion years. And there's more than 100 sites like these across the country. Um, to me, they're like just architecturally fascinating. They're really interesting to sort of see up close, but you don't get a sense of them until you see them from the sky. And then it's like really, really odd. Um, and some of the sites are constructed away from populations, but you have some like this, which is nearby um, here in St. Louis, and actually become a kind of recreational site because you can climb up on top of this disposal cell, which I always think is really strange. <laughs> Um, so they're ingenious constructions, and they're built to keep us safe, so, you know, as much as I'm like, ooh, these are sort of spooky haunted places, they're actually, I'm like really impressed with the people who um, kind of dedicate their life to like kind of constructing these and engineering these. I mean, they're meant to keep us safe. We have to live amongst an incredible amount of radioactive waste. Um, but I always think, too, like, what are we doing, right, with this mass quantities of radioactive waste, what are we leaving behind for generations? So as much as I'm, like, enamored by them, I'm also, like, what, what do we keep making, right? Um, so this last project I want to show you is um, a project that I did for a number of years in Colorado, a town called Eurovan. Um, and it's still, you can find it on a map. However, it's not very easy to find it in person uh, because the entire town is buried under clay, soil, and rock. And so Standard Chemical Company established the town of approximately 1,000 residents in 1912. They named it after uh, uranium and vanadium, two minerals that were mined in the area. This is not too far from where my in-laws live. And so I visit them in the summer and I return to Eurovan again and again. Um, I've come to know a lot of the people who grew up there who talk about this town that they grew up in, like incredibly beautiful place. Um, but it's like, oh, this place, but this place doesn't exist anymore. And so activities at the local processing mill um, contain, contaminated the soil and groundwater with radioactive chemicals, so much so that by 1986, the Environmental Protection Agency closed the town and relocated all of the residents. And they actually shredded, like every building, they just shredded all of the homes, um, the mining plant, the school, the library, the, the shops, everything that was there, um, and burned and buried it. So it's a 680-acre Superfund site. And so for this project, I created these three-dimensional laser engraved pigment prints. And what I did was um, I went and took photographs of the site of Yerevan today, which is basically nothing. <laughs> it's just um, flatland. There's no buildings there anymore. And then I took historical photographs of the residential buildings, um, the plants, the schools, everything that was there. And uh, I'm using the laser, um, again, engraver to burn into the photograph and burn away these historical photographs over contemporary prints. And then they're put over um, a light box. And so when you look at the photographic prints, there's just layers of the photograph that are like burned away slightly. And so you can kind of see light through it. Um, but this is what they look like when they're over the backlit frame. So, um, yeah, I think this is it. So I would 
love to answer any questions if you have them. teach here right a few years ago uh, one of the things the committee and, and all of us were so excited about was the materiality in your work and that uh, you know those of us on the committee not being really well versed in, in contemporary photography um, we're really uh, kind of taken aback by that and really uh, excited by that and uh, where I think a lot of uh, you know maybe uh, photographers uh, we think of kind of like the fidelity of the image and sort of like the kind of like the crispness of that and the concept of that um, being kind of separate from materiality, like it's especially with the, the advent of digital photography. Uh, and I was wondering how you could talk a little bit more about how materiality and physicality of the way you manipulate and create images is really important to your practice. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, it is, and it's weird because I can kind of oscillate back and forth. Like, I'm deeply interested in, like, getting to the conceptual heart of the photographs, and, um, you know, sometimes especially you know in the world of digital photography and like COVID where we're seeing so much work on screens and not like interacting with the physical as much. Um, I love that about photography but I also my like initial background was in the dark room and this like magical space where you're using your hands and like discovering things like the image just appears in front of you in the dark and um, I, I just have that like really romantic relationship with photography that never goes away. Um, but like having both is is a really interesting kind of thing to me. And also like working in video and performance work too, where it's just so much in your head and it's so much about like expressing concept. Um, but I think in terms of materiality, like I still am like really taken by sitting in front of the object, right? And thinking about the history of the object and the hands that touch the object and like that act of making. Um, and material is like connected to meaning for me, right? Like this work is totally different in digital form than it is in this like incredibly obscure old photographic process um, that's linked to material. So, um, you know, I think and I'm attracted to work on both ends of the spectrum, but I do, I read a lot about, like, materiality and, um, like, Sherry Turkle's work. I'm always like, Sherry Turkle, Sherry Turkle. <laughs> um, but, like, <laughs> her, her writings about materiality and um, the kind of, like, embedded meaning within that, it's, it's maybe will always just be really important in my work. You know, unless you have just had a child. Yes. <laughs> it's clear to me that you, in pursuit of this work, you are a dogged researcher, and you put your own body in jeopardy. How, how have you covered this? How have you maintained this idea? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, like people bring that up. Like, aren't you? Like, really are scared of working with this material. Um, for me, no. Like, Part of my early work was in a science lab and, you know, working with chemicals all the time. And so, um, especially with working with uranotypes, right? Like, I know what I'm working with. I know the risks. And I can take all of the safety precautions to work with it in a way that's really safe. What scares me more is knowing that I have family members who drink milk <laughs> every day, right? That was poisoned. Right? That I have friends now um, and family members, Native American family members, who cannot drink the water in the places that they live, who worry about their children playing in the soil outside. That's the thing that gets to me, right? Um, and, you know, in some ways it's like I, that, that privilege of like knowing what I'm working with and working safely, like that's a part of my work too. It's like, and this privilege of like knowledge and being able to distance myself um, and protect myself, but then knowing that I come from the background 
and I'm deeply connected to people who cannot do that, whose um, environment was completely destroyed by the government and who, who live with that every day of their life. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's like a really big thing to me. Um, but I'm always conscious about it. And I'll say paranoid. Because <laughs> it's, it's true. It's to the point of paranoia. I have to like test the water in places that we go. Um, but that like level of consciousness is what drives my work too. Like I think about, yeah, I just had a baby and what kind of world of, like I'm bringing her up in and what kind of world are we leaving behind if we don't put pressure on policymakers to change things? Um, yeah, like all of that's a part of it. Um, the, the, a little bit of the fear is a fuel for my work too. Yeah. What was the vibe on the ground in Georgia when you were there? Oh. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, a lot of people are really supportive of the plan. Um, Waynesboro, Georgia is in a place that uh, is really challenged economically. Um, they have the highest rates of cancer um, in that county in Burke County. Um, and, you know, it's it's like a lot of other places. It's kind of this Faustian bargain. Like, that's what happened in Fukushima as well. Um, you have a big nuclear plant that comes in that offers jobs for people, um, that offers incredible amounts of support for schools and um, to build infrastructure in a place that's, you know, economically struggling. It's really hard to say no to you. At the same time, like, I really admire the people who work there, right? Like, you can also take that sort of mindset of this is an incredible technology that we have at our disposal that's like a combat for climate change, right? Like, I can't deny that, like, um, they have visions of the future that are as positive as I would like them to be as well, right? Uh, but I actually found it incredibly difficult to access anybody who opposed the plant or who would openly talk to me about opposing the plant. Um, and in the case of Waynesboro, Georgia, the community and that has openly opposed the plant are black members in the community. Um, and uh, one of my mentors growing up, she said, it's not environmental racism, it's uh, racial environmentalism. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, and in the case of uh, Waynesboro, a lot of um, individuals had their land given to them um, because they had ancestors who were slaves. And there's a lot of plantation land, and so the land was given to them. And then this huge nuclear plant came in and from the stories that I've been told essentially stole the land away from them. Um, and there's this kind of uprising. Uh, some of the photographs I didn't show them today, but I have our um, Reverend Charles Utley, who's at the kind of center of um, this program to educate people in the community about the effects and to prepare people in the community in case of a nuclear disaster. And so I have a photograph here um, of iodine tablets that um, Charles Utley was a part of this, like distributing these tablets in case of an emergency. You take it, it protects your thyroid um, from damaging radiation. Uh, and of course the plant was like, totally up in arms about this, like, you're spreading misinformation, and, you know, in his mind, like, he's protecting members of the community who live here who are at risk. He wants them to know all of the risks. Um, it took a long time for me, though, to access that community, in part because I'm an outsider, so it's totally understandable, um, and in part because there really is a radical racial divide. So it's a challenging thing. And this project, there, uh, there are a lot of portraits. You will see in my book that you only see the landscape images. And that's in part because um, the members of this community who, and plant workers who trusted me with their story 
um, and who trusted me to let me take their portraits. Um, that's a really like sacred thing to me, and I show this work in spaces in which I can have a conversation about it, and a conversation about the fact that, like, what does it mean for me, not a part of this community, not at risk by the plants, right, to go in and to photograph these people and to share their stories. Um, there's a like, eth there's all kinds of ethical problems that I have to like have a conversation about, and so I don't publish their um, photographs anywhere that's linked to any sort of monetary value or where I can't have a conversation about the complication between me and my subject. Um, you know, Daylight Books, my publisher, who's like a really wonderful nonprofit um, publisher, they're still making money off my book, right? I don't want them to make money off of these community members who trusted me. So that's a, a very important relationship that I maintain with them. Building on that um, idea of like uh, how your your project of uh, like witnessing the nuclear energy industry uh, goes forward, you have your book published and your notoriety increases, and you also talk about how um, you're interested in kind of complicating the subject and not necessarily uh, in imposing your own political view on it. How, as you move forward, uh, do, how uh, how do you see it going in terms of your being able to be stealth, to have the kind of the freedom to take the, where the information leads you, uh, and people, uh, you become increasingly known, so how does that affect you as you move uh, your project forward? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's hard too. At the beginning, I felt like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to like, put my politics on it because then I lose access to the place, right? Um, and David Mizell does that a lot with his black maps. Like, he doesn't take a strict, he's photographing like aerial photographs of toxic landscapes, right? And I like sometimes criticize that because, you know, he sells them for a lot of money, but doesn't take a stance on anything one way or the other. Um, you know, and that's in part because he'll lose access. People won't let him fly over these landscapes anymore. And I, I felt like that in the beginning, and then, you know, at some point it was like, well, I, I think the more I dig into this, like, I just can't be neutral. Like, I can't. And so I'm really open and honest about that, that I'm, like, very critical. But when I go to places um, like Plant Vogel, like I also go to learn because I always have more to learn. And there's always people's uh, viewpoints that I have to be open to. But people will see from this work that I'm not neutral and, and I am critical. And that's okay if I lose access because of that. But I think a lot of my uh, more recent work has been about sort of discovering places and this history in a way that usually people who work in the nuclear industry are really excited to tell me about. So um, it doesn't seem to have been too much of a problem. And like with this work, I'm really not like criticizing the, the people who work here, the people who research it. Like they're spending all of their time um, figuring out ways that we like live amongst this mess that we've made and protect ourselves. And like that's, you know, something I think is really pretty amazing, so. Um, have you connected with local groups and communities around this issue of radioactive waste and the risks, the health risks and the concerns involved? I mean, I'm aware just because of having friends in the activist community and kind of it's on the periphery for me, it's not like something that I'm super focused on, so I don't have a lot of like specifics, but you know, with the Weldon Springs mm -hmm. area and, and other areas locally, there's a lot of um, concern. I'm wondering if you've connected with people around that and um, if there's potential future work in that for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, not as much as I'd like to, I think it partly because of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> like, has restricted so much, but um, there's a local group that, um, you know, looking at the issues around Weldon Springs and also, um, um, what is the other, um, 
I'm totally blanking. It will come to me. The Manicot or something like that. Yeah, Manicot, and um, there's also like the big dump that I'm forgetting. What's the name of it? Um, what? I think it's Westlake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Westlake. Um, and uh, so there's an interesting group called Just Moms. Mm -hmm. And I'm like incredibly impressed with their work. It's a group of mothers who um, were dealing with a lot of the radioactive material in the rivers, and they had like incredible health um, uh, risks happening, and a lot of children were getting sick. And so they formed this group. Um, and I'm really impressed with what they've done because rather than fight to have the material that they knew existed removed, which is a lot of what we do is say like, oh, we don't want it in my backyard, get rid of it. Like they realize, okay, if we um, put pressure on policymakers to come in and to remove this material, where's it gonna go? It's just gonna go to another marginalized community, right, and affect them. And so instead what they did was put pressure on the EPA to come in and do frequent testing. Um, and to me, that's it's sort of like, okay, rather than be afraid of this, let's educate ourselves, let's educate people in the community, let's understand what we're living amongst, let's put pressure on policymakers to come in and to test these things, um, let's let people in the community know what risks they already like are living with. Um, and so I think that they've done an incredible job at like bringing attention to local, very local issues. Um, but that's just one. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot out there, yeah. certainly still. The other question I had was like, as you, so, you know, you visited these sites before you kind of discovered this deeper connection of the uranotype and the, the air, the radioactive air, you know, after the bomb. And so how did your relationship with these sites like evolve as your process with material was evolving? Did it shift at all or, mm -hmm. um, yeah? Um, like you're, you're asking about uh, like doing the research but then discovering my own sort of family history connection? Uh, that, and also just like, you know, looking at one of these images in digital form, which is how they originated versus like then going through this process of discovering the uranotype and like applying that to that particular image. Like does that, being involved in that process, does that change how you relate to these sites? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I know for me, and it's, it's kind of what I hope happens to other people, but it's like this slight little shift. It's like I can be somewhere and and I understand the history of that place and I understand some of the effects of that place and it's like just this little shift inside of me. Um, I don't know what it is. It's like discomfort. It's like a feeling of being haunted maybe. Um, and I think that I'm like deep, I have this deep relationship to place that, um, I don't know, it's it's like going back to a place, it's not nostalgia or like soul nostalgia, but it's it's like a really, really strange feeling. Um, when you know like how many people were affected by something, it's like that place just is haunted, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like that there's an element that, of that that comes through through the uranotype. It, it's like taking an aspect of these sites that is invisible and making it visible, laying it on top of them. So, interesting. How do you define yourself as a photographer? Do you think of this as documentary work? Mm. As conceptually <laughs> engaged or um, you know, documentary artist? Fine artists, where I mean, you're dealing with materials in such intense ways, but they're so documentary. Yeah. How do you? How would you say if someone said, "What's you know, what is your basis of photography?" Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't really see myself as a documentary photographer because I'm not like 
I'm not just there documenting. Like, I leave myself the space to sort of manipulate or to like, guide people through something different. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that I have, like, a good definition. <laughs> I mean, a like, to be honest, a lot of my work is really didactic. Like, I'm somebody that often works in the obvious, right? Like, I, I, like, I like things to have a level of clarity. I like collaborating with people. And, um, that's why I use, like, geographers to help work on maps and to, like, pinpoint. So there is, like, a level of of engagement with the thing itself, like, and the knowledge of that and the discovery of that. But um, I still hope as, like, being an artist, like, it's not a scientific pursuit. I don't have a hypothesis that I have to come to. Like, I still, the questions are still more interesting to me. So I hope that people come to these uh, and have some kind of emotional reaction. Whether that's like discomfort, right, or that they find something of, like visually appealing, you know, whatever that might be. I think that's just part of my process as an artist. It's still the kind of emotional pursuit that I'm after, more than just like the kind of intellectual pursuit. That's very interesting because it seems intellectually focused, and I see what you're talking about because they do good work. Really, yeah. There's a gut response. I was interested in the title of the show, Redacted Landscapes, and that word redacted yeah. calling to ideas about you know censorship or secrecy or sort of cover up, uh, and how you you talked a little bit in your lecture here about the position of your work as. Clearly, you have an opinion, but you're trying to also create uh, sort of work that's kind of objective in the sort of the imagery and that and we're supposed to kind of uh, bring to it what we will. And I'm wondering how you uh, kind of negotiate that idea of redacted and kind of what, what's being redacted and you as the redactor of the uh, images, too. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I think I, I think of it a little bit more as things that have been redacted. Um, either by government to some degree um, or they've kind of been redacted by corporations, right? Um, like, and, and I think about places like Yerevan, which is, I mean, like literally a town that has been removed. So I think of it more like that, but um, yeah, I mean, there's some obscuring that I, I'm doing as well. That's an interesting question. Well, thank you all. Yeah, one more question. One more question. Um, you know, uh, your, uh, the way that you come at your work is uh, science and art, right? And you know, you were talking about the history of photography being that, that kind of uh, synthesis as well. Uh, and now you're teaching in an art department. Um, uh, but you, you kind of diffuse this kind of um, uh, kind of way forward by kind of fusing uh, kind of questions that are empirical and uh, uh, not only so social but scientifically based. Uh, is that something that you are interested in uh, sensing and select students and nurturing? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I think the like fostering curiosity is like a big part of it, um, but I definitely have like wonderful students who are always, you know, like deeply engaged in those questions, and um, I think like the the scientific questions, the social questions, I'm really interested in um, students making social justice work. That's just always like been really exciting, and so I hope that I like foster that and encourage them to seek. Um, more questions, right, and find answers for themselves. I think that's a big part of teaching. I just is one of the many things that excites me. Thank you all.